and courage. I am Pamela Mason. I am the co-chair of the Literacy and Languages Concentration at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I am delighted to welcome you today to this conversation as part of our Children's Authors Series, sponsored by the Asquith Education Forum, our signature lecture series, bringing leaders in the education field to our community to share knowledge, experience, and insights. This forum was established in 1998 by the children and grandchildren of Herbert Asquith, AB class of 1907, to strengthen the intellectual life of the school for, with the exchange of ideas, conversation, and debate. Today, we will be talking about the power of written storytelling and its implication for perseverance and resilience across many communities. I speak with an author, a daughter of a Holocaust survivor and a teenage refugee who documented her parents' stories based on the journals her mother and father kept during those difficult and stressful times. But first, some housekeeping. Today's event is being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can also visit gse.harvard.edu slash Asquith for recording and information on future episodes. Please submit your questions throughout today's webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You will not have access to the chat. You will also find closed caption access there as well. Now I am pleased to welcome our guest. Mona Gulbik is an author, recording artist, and internationally renowned concert pianist. She learned to play the piano from her mother, Holocaust survivor Lisa Jura, whose stories inspired the books, The Children of Wilsdon Lane. Based on the true story of her mother, Mona Golubek describes the inspirational story of her 14-year-old of Lisa's escape from Nazi-controlled Austria to England on the famed Kindertransport, and how Lisa's love of music gave her and other displaced children the strength to survive. Mona has written a collection of books for different age groups based on her mother's story. Welcome, Mona. Thank you for being here. Pamela, what an honor to be here with you. I am so honored to have been invited by the Asquith Education Forum and certainly by Harvard University. Um, this is a dream come true for me. So thank you so much. All right, so we wanna start out with um, a question about storytelling. Okay. So your mother had, and your father had a very powerful story, but you focused on your mother's story. And it's a very powerful form of communication. So what did you feel was unique about your mother's story and why did you feel compelled to share it? So what happened was when I was a little kid, my mother taught me the piano. I must've been about five, six years old. Hmm. And she made the lesson so exciting. She always said that each piece of music tells a story. So between the Beethoven and the Bach, I learned about her life. She told me how she was a 14 year old girl who loved the piano and had a dream. And the most important day of her week was a Friday when she would go to her piano lesson. She would put a perfect hat on, uh, step out of the apartment where she lived in the Jewish district of Vienna. She boarded the trolley. This was the Vienna of Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert. And every time the trolley passed the Philharmonic Hall, she closed her eyes and she went into a daydream. Now she wasn't on that trolley. She was on the stage of the great Philharmonic Hall about to make her debut in the Grieg Piano Concerto. And she imagined that her mother and her father and her sisters were right there in the first row. The timpani erupts from the Philharmonic Orchestra and then she plays. <laughs> Thank you. 
And then the orchestra plays the theme that will become the theme of her life. And one day, many years later, she'll teach it to me. And then in her daydream, she imagines and plays. Singer Strasse, she looks up. It was the street sign where she would always get off, but now it had been changed to Meister Singer Strasse, changed from Mahler Strasse. And she could see that darkness that was taking over her city, the Nazis everywhere, but it really didn't matter. She made her way into the studio of her piano teacher. The teacher seemed a little different that day. She went over to the piano and began a piece that we all know. The Moonlight Sonata of Beethoven kind of takes you back to old world Vienna and the world that we are going to lose in this story. Now, my mother always told me that the professor would sit next to her with the score on his lap and he would wave his hands in the air. But today there was nothing. And eventually he told her that he could no longer teach her because now there were laws against the Jews. And she told me that was the day that everything changed for her. She knew she would never see the professor again. She memorized everything, made her way out. Now she could see that darkness. And she got home to where she lived, where my grandmother, for whom I'm named, Malka, came out of the kitchen and said, don't worry, I taught you before, I'll teach you again. And they both sat down and played a beautiful Chopin Nocturne. And I would like to imagine that the music floated out the window. As they played together. But then... <laughs> I smashed the piano to give you an idea of Kristallnacht, which we mm. know is the most horrible night to sweep across Europe. And of course, as the de desperation set in, the families were desperate to save their children. And my grandfather, my beloved grandfather, Abraham, he was able to get one ticket, the most horrible decision, three daughters. Who mm. would, would it be Sonia, the baby, 12 years old? Would it be Rosie, 17 years old, just near the cutoff, to be allowed to go? Or would it be Lisa, my mother, 14 years old, who had her music? So my mom told me how she would go to the piano every night and play this piece of music that we all know, Claire de Lune by Debussy. She didn't want to hear the arguing of her parents, of who they would choose. And then one night, my grandmother came into the room and she could see from the tears that she had been chosen. she hold on to, to make her way into an uncertain future, even as my grandmother told her not to worry. And it leads me to answer your question of what makes this so unique in a way. I decided I wanted to go out and write those books and share this story with the world because I knew that there was a message here. When you're faced with the greatest obstacles or choices in your life or decision that alters the course of your life, what do you turn to? to hold on inside yourself, to find that resilience, to find that courage, to find that faith that you will make it through. So I decided I wanted to write those books mm -hmm. because my grandmother told my mother at that train station, the pivotal words when she said goodbye to her. She said, I want you to make a promise to me, Lisa, 
that you're going to hold on to your music. And remember, I'll be with you every step of the way through every note. Every time you're at the piano, I'll be there with you through that music. And I think it's the music that elevates this story and the message that comes through the music that you experience, even as you're reading the book, when you hear it inside yourself, and that message of what do we, what do we look for in life? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your, your, your playing and for that explanation about the origin of these stories, which brings us back. You, you showed one of the versions of your stories. You've actually written four versions of the Wilsden Lane story. And so I'm curious um, how you decided you know, what to change in the story? Was it, was it appropriate language? Was it appropriate con uh, concepts? You know, for, the, for readers of different ages as well as reading levels. So what did you keep and what did you change as you took the story from its, um, um, I don't wanna say easy, but you know, it's, it's least complicated, I guess, version on up to the chapter book that, that you have written. And what did you decide this is the kernel of the story that has to be able to be transported and communicated across all four versions. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful question. Actually, when I first started 20 years ago, the original book was the bigger book. The, what was uh, uh, programmed to come out as the adult book in the retail market. I and see. so it is the biggest one, the original one, the, the Children of Wilston Lane but it found its sweet spot among individuals in the educational world and philanthropists that believe this could be a great message for high school students. So they first got behind this to help me to bring this across America. Wonderful folks from uh, the uh, Milken Family Foundation, the Annenberg Foundation, they brought it to their educators, to their teachers. And so many of these teachers embraced it uh, from a cross curriculum perspective. As time went on, my publishing house, uh, when they saw what was happening and the growth of this uh, message out there, they got behind me then to create the young reader book, uh, which was geared towards um, more an 11 year old, a 12 year old. Although when before this came out and we were doing very large, what is known as the Wilsden Reads, where I would go into a city and students would by the tens of thousands read the book through the grant generosity of philanthropists to gift the book to school systems. And then I would come and do a live performance, a multimedia performance. Mm -hmm. 11 year olds, 12 year olds were reading the original book. For example, the entire fifth grade of Dallas, Texas read the original red book. But then this came out and this tended to be the winner of the, of the books at that point, the young reader, because it was a faster read and basically, this one was sort of half the length of the original one. Mm -hmm. so you get the main points of the story. We didn't sacrifice anything of those messages and of the characters or whatnot. But perhaps we reduced down a little bit of the, of the, uh, the backstories of how mm -hmm. did the garden look in a certain way? Or was, the weather, was the weather a little bit? <laughs> we could slim it down to be able to do that because we could see that... Um, given the curriculums and the uh, challenges of scheduling, teachers wanted a faster read. Mm -hmm. so that's what worked out to come with the Young Reader book. And this became the book that was adopted around the world in multiple languages. It's now in Spanish and Hebrew and uh, French and Italian. And uh, it's coming out in Arabic. I see. It's coming out in, uh, I'm so proud, in Ukrainian mm -hmm. language has just been made. So somehow this became the sweet spot. But then my wonderful publishers, the Hachette group that uh, also has Little Brown, mm -hmm. they decided that they wanted to do um, an illustrated book. And this was the dream of my life to be able to have this to come to the precious souls of a five-year-old, of a six-year-old. How do you show this story without scaring that soul and that heart? And I know that's very much what you're asking me here. How do you tell a story that is of loss and of seeking courage to a young reader. So we decided to concentrate very strongly on the dream, the dream uh, that the young girl yes. had. Mm -hmm. And the dream that she would be able to have at the end 
uh, when this marvelous Italian artist, Sonia Postatini, did the illustrations. And the wonderful co-writer from uh, Canada, Emile Scher, who did Hannah's Suitcase and uh, various uh, works like that, mm -hmm. we decided let's concentrate on the message of resilience. Let's okay. concentrate on a dream. And in the back matter, for the teachers, we, we spoke about the loss and what would happen so that the young child would be inspired reading this. And then at the same time, they decided to bring out the chapter book, which also had the black and white illustrations. And again, we wanted to concentrate really on what, how do we rise above? There are so many things that are written about genocide and the Holocaust and whatnot, but we wanted this to be a book that even despite it all, you can do it. Because I began to see as students around America and the globe experienced my live show or read the book, they would say, if your mother can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. If Lisa could get through it, then I can get through it. All right, so that kind of um, answers my next question, but I wanna make sure that I understand it. So um, is, I guess I'll let you, 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 you answer the question. How does your mother's story deepen our understanding of the Holocaust narrative? Because it's, it, unfortunately, it's been, it, it is in our past, it's discussed a lot, and more recently, it's come up again. I'm very proud that I think the way we wrote this book and the way the, the, the authors helped me in the writing of the book, it makes it so accessible to a young reader because <clears throat> the actual subject of the Holocaust is so immense and so gargantuan and so scary and so overwhelming. But if you can get to a heart through an individual story, so they relate to Lisa through her dream and the fact that they're, they're like her, mm -hmm. they have dreams and, and they wanna make something of their lives as well. And then the Holocaust enters in, then they're cured. We noticed in the thousands of letters that come to us, wow, in reading your mother's story, I never knew that this happened to people. I mm -hmm. never knew that the Holocaust even took place. You've opened my eyes. Uh, wow, I will never look at a refugee in the same way that I did look. They're just like me. They, they have dreams and goals and, and courage and resilience. So somehow through relating to Lisa and her dreams and her goals and her challenges, we were able to deepen a, a young student's desire to know about the Holocaust. And then with all the assets that we're creating in my signature partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation, they could read more, they could see testimony, they could understand the greater, greater uh, um, story here about it. But I really do believe you understand something through an individual story and through the heart of a, of, of a particular character. So, so, kind of, so taking, not taking the Holocaust and just pushing it out there, but really making it about a story of, 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 of a person and how it relates to other people's stories. And her fear all along, even as she kept going for her dream, where are my parents? Mm. Where are my sisters? Mm -hmm. So that by the time you come to the end of the story and the truth is revealed, you are, you are heartbroken, elated, you have all kinds of emotions, and then you really understand the magnitude of what the Holocaust is or any genocide. Mm -hmm. Because you've, you've traveled in Lisa's footsteps every step of the way. Well, that brings me to questioning, how has Lisa's story impacted you personally and perhaps your parenting or your interactions with others? So I honestly believe, Pamela, that I was never given a choice in a way. I think I came into this planet or in, through my mother and she never, she wanted me to know that story. It's not that she hammered it or did it in a dark way. She did it in an incredible way because I learned about the characters at Wilsden Lane. I learned about the fascinating people in the tapestry of her life. Wonderful people that saved the lives of all of these 10,000 Jewish children and the British people that were so brave under the bombing. So it was a positive story. Um, but I, I think that whenever you're a child of people that have suffered horribly, even if you don't realize it unconsciously, something happens to you inside. 
And so when I was a little girl and I loved my mother so much and she told me this fascinating story, I didn't understand how it went inside my heart mm -hmm. unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And years later, I was engaged to play the very piece I just played for all of you, the Greek piano concerto myself. Mm -hmm. And I woke up the next day and I thought, wow, that's the piece she always told me about. Suddenly all those memories came flooding back. And I thought maybe if I could get a book out there, if I could get a film made, I could inspire so many young people to Lisa's message. I didn't have a clue. I tell young people and educators all over the globe, I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't know how to do any of this, but I had a fire in my heart. I had a dream, just like my mother. And I said, you're looking at someone who never gave up against all the rejections, against all the obstacles, just like Lisa. I kept going. And one day I got that book published. Mm. So it has changed the course of my life, but I think my life was meant to be this. And it has also made me realize that I'm not separate from anybody else on this planet. We are all almost one beating heart. I know it's a phrase that's used over and over and it's become a little bit cliche that we're mm. in this together, but stories like this really tell you we are really one heart on this planet. And I often say that the reason that I also went out to do this is that my mother or my father etched 6 million numbers on my heart. Those 6 million numbers inspire me to want to go forward and tell Lisa's story. No story is more important than another. Mm -hmm. Those 6 million are the engine that keep me going. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so you've, you've talked around, around it and, and, and let, I want you to go right straight toward the heart of it as you say, these six million have been etched in your heart. You know, what are some of the universal themes that you hope that readers will get out of, the, the, out of any, any and all of the versions of the Wilston Lane story? Well, as I said, as I shared in the beginning, probably the strongest is well, I would actually back up and say the strongest question I pose to young people across the globe is what is our purpose here on earth? What is our responsibility to another human being? This is a story about parents who did the ultimate sacrifice for their children. This is a story of a nation, Britain, that opened its heart and soul to 10,000 children that would not have been, al I wouldn't be alive today if they hadn't made that decision. Mm. So I think first it's a universal question that we all ask all the time. What's our purpose? Do we wanna make a difference walking through this world? Do we wanna help other people in need? Those are the most important values, I think. And then the second question would really be, what do you hold on to in life when you're faced with the greatest challenges that come across for my mother? I often ask myself, what did she feel in that moment when the train was speeding away from the Vienna train station? The psychic wound, the incredulous emotions that she must have had. How did she go for that dream of music? How did she survive an uncertain future? They didn't have the internet back then, right? They didn't have any of these things. These young people strove to keep promises to their parents through a, the darkest uh, time in history with no knowledge of whether they would ever see their families again. And, it's, it's, and they, they went on to create extraordinary lives mm -hmm. and to influence others and to inspire others just as my parents inspired me. So I would say those are the universal messages. What has been very moving to me as I began to take this journey was to see the universality of those messages. I was sent by a marvelous family, the Fisher family to South Africa before the COVID, where we brought the study of this book and the live performances to 10,000 learners in South Africa. I went on the stage where Nelson Mandela had spoken from the balcony when he was freed from prison. So you can imagine what I felt walking out on that stage. Um, and I will never forget the cheering of these young people 
two years ago in South Africa. And when we came to our last concert and the, the, the applause had quieted down, there was a shout from the balcony, thousands of kids in this big uh, hall there. And a young girl yelled out, Mona, how do I hold on to my dream? And 4,000 eyeballs looked up at her <laughs> and then turned back and looked at me. <laughs> And I remember for one moment, I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to answer? But yeah. I, of course, stressed what Lisa had done, what we all have to do. That's the universal message. Despite, I mean, if we ever look at a country that has faced such obstacles, that is South Africa. Mm -hmm. And yet that message of Lisa from another time of a Jewish teenager in another uh, generation resonated so strongly for that young girl. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Wilston Lane was a place and your Lisa was not the only child there. So what do you know and what can you share about that community of young people who have all been um, put together but having experienced a common, common trauma? So the fascinating thing is that these kids would never have met each other except for what happened. Uh, and my mother always told me when I was a little girl, Wilson Lane, Wilson Lane, and the matron of the hostel, Mrs. Cohen, and the mysterious characters. There was a boy named Johnny King Kong. He was called that because he was very big and he lugged bags of cement, a 15 year old giant of a kid who wrote poetry at nighttime. He had escaped from Cologne. There was Gunter who also came from Cologne. There was Aaron, the boy that my mother would eventually become sweet upon. There was Gina. I heard about all these mysterious characters that would never have met had it not been for the kinder transport and whatnot. And in fact, there's a marvelous moment in the story, in the book, or I, I must tell you that there's a marvelous moment that I remember when I was a child and my mother told me the first moment she walked into the hostel after being in the countryside for a year. And she heard the chatter of children. She heard the chatter of the cook in the kitchen preparing the Sabbath meal, but nothing mattered to her because when she looked in the corner, she saw a familiar object, a piano covered by a shawl. And just to give you a little theme, she walked over to that piano, lifted up the lid, tried to play that Grieg, that she couldn't remember the sound, but then she remembered the beautiful slow movement in the most gorgeous sound, the most noble melody. And one by one, the children came out of their rooms and they stood on the staircase and they looked at my mother. And my mother would always tell me over and over in the piano lessons, in that moment, every boy in the hostel fell in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> wow, all right. So they, they created a community of, of support. And I, I, I like that you describe that young man as a very you know, ha, um, strong man, but they had that soft side of poetry. That's so we funny. have literacy and literature kind of always threaded through yes. um, the story. And they banded together and supported each other. They became yes. the family to each other. Yes, yes. yes. Um, what, did they stay in contact? Not only did they stay in contact, I then met them as I started to grow up. And that's how I got the different storylines. I, I decided see. to write the book. I reached out to Gunter. I reached out to Gina. I reached out to the characters and I interviewed them. And in fact, with one of the, char one of the characters, when I came to his home, he took me up into an attic and he gave me an old 78 recording that my mother had made for him of the Liebestron. Oh, really? So I heard my mother's playing at the age of uh, 18 or 17 and I heard my mother's voice on oh. that recording. And that recording now sits in a museum here in Los Angeles. Oh, well, that's wonderful. And it really, what else? Um, so that kind of brings us into the writing process. So yes. you said that you, you have these stories that you remember your mother telling you, and now you're talking about um, interviewing 
some of the other children in, of Wilsden Lane. What other part of the um, authoring um, and your craft um, did you um, focus on? Did you find came easily to you or other areas that we, you struggled with? Because we're, we're, you're part of the children's authors series. So we want to get right. behind your craft. Right. Well, I often say to everyone, I'll never write another book again. <laughs> You've written four. <laughs> it is the hardest thing in the world. My goodness. Um, but I had extraordinary co-authors and, and tremendous support uh, editors and whatnot. We did, uh, for the original book, we did vast research to make sure that we had the historical underpinnings correct and the timelines and whatnot. But there were a lot of challenges because my mother was no longer alive by the time I was really working on it. Uh, some of the characters were gone. Their memories were challenged. One of the main characters did not want his real name put into the book. So we had to change that name. And we prefaced that at the beginning of the book to say some characters were combined and the recollections as best as we could uh, to do that. And of course, we're putting in dialogue. Mm -hmm. We are creating dialogue that obviously I wasn't born, I wasn't back there, or none of us were to hear that dialogue. So we took that liberty, which we always uh, speak about. But we could tell from the different interviews that we had recorded and documented what they were thinking, what they were feeling. And my basic thing that I always say is that the heart of the story, the major aspects of the story are all based in the storylines of what we were shared and told. It's just that we had to, we also had to um, create and, and step up to certain challenges in the writing. And what were some of those challenges? It, I would say one of the greatest challenges was to respect the one family that did not want fully his name. Uh, and we chose then to, it's funny, I'll go back to say that when my mother told me that all the boys were in love with her, <laughs> I found out later on when I interviewed that there was a bit of truth. They all seemed to have crushes on her because she was um, a fascinating character, full of life, very dramatic, the music, uh, whatnot. And so we chose to take, we chose to combine two characters and bring their storylines together into the story mostly those sticking with the main character that my mother did end up uh, having a relationship with, um, uh, fell in love with. Um, I would say that was it. And then also not quite knowing some of the details of the background of what happened to Malka and Abraham. We had to do a lot of research going to Yad Vashem. We had to go to other family members to find letters that had made their way to Mexico, certain things that were reporting on what had happened to the older sister, Rosie, mm -hmm. to be able to put all these timelines together. It was a, um, a real excavation of historical facts that we had to get. Okay. Which um, brings me to asking you about the connections that you see between your mother's Wills and Lane story and current events. Wow. One of the great things that, that has happened to me two years ago is that I've begun a signature partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation. And as a result, they very strongly are taking my mother's story and wanting to make it relevant to young people today and to current events. They brought me to London about a half a year ago and we filmed uh, for Discovery Education, a wonderful film called um, The Courage of a Refugee, Their Resilience, which has been seen by students uh, across America on Discovery Education. In, in that film was a Syrian refugee of today, speaking about her challenges, as well as a refugee that came out on the kinder transport. Next week, I am leaving to go to Poland, where I will perform in the Poland Museum, a fundraiser that the USC Shoah Foundation is, along with the Corret Foundation, are uh, sponsoring for the Ukrainian refugee crisis. So if ever there was a message or ever there was a story that really spotlights what is happening to us today and makes us realize that we must learn from the past, these stories, if, if we want them to change and if we want them to stop, 
we've got to be inspired by these stories and say, hey, no more. Let's try to find a world where we can change all of this. So my mother's story has enormous relevance and I'm so thrilled with the offer now to have the book come out in Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language. It's also already in Polish. So this will be very signature for me on this trip. Well, good, thank you. That's a wonderful opportunity to expand the notion, um, unfortunately, of, of refugees, of family separation, and that holding on to something, um, you know, to, to endure the trauma yeah. of, these, of, of, of the time during the Holocaust and, and our current situation. Um, so music is a character in your books. Yes. You know, it's, it's that with the focus now here, at least in the United States on basic skills, especially in response to, you know, our public health issue, the climate and school closings and various openings and closings, music instruction has been all but eliminated from the curriculum. Um, what do you think music brings to learning and teaching? It's a secret weapon. How do you explain even those few little little moments. How do you explain that when Myra Hess, the great Myra Hess during World War II, the British pianist, when the bombs were coming down, yet the people would go to their factories, they would go and work and then they would line up around the National Gallery of Art because they wanted to hear Myra Hess play. They knew the music would lift them up and give them inspiration and she would play. Jesus, Joy of Man's Desiring by Bach. I mean, you listen to that, how can you not be inspired? It's, how does it work? It's magic, it just goes through the air. And I say to young kids when I go out on stage, I say, how many of you love music? Well, they all raise their hands. And it doesn't matter if they love pop or jazz or classical, or maybe they're listening to rap and certain rap things are very exciting and energy and, and, and relates to them. The music changes the atmosphere. And kids say that when they're down, if they listen to their music, it, it picks them up or it, it uh, resonates to where they are. Um, Yes, I think that this is deeply sad that in our educational system, we don't have the economics for this because the arts and music are extraordinary and magical. Um, we can only hope and try to work to bring that back in. And in my little small part here with this live performances that we bring to uh, edu educators and teachers and students across the globe, we have a chance to push that message. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think um, we'll bring in um, Rebecca at this time, and then we will entertain some questions. I see one already around advocating for the arts. So we will, I'm going to, I will keep that question in advance, but I'm pleased to um, invite Be Rebecca Keel to join us. She is the project coordinator for Wilsden Reads, which Mona very quickly mentioned in her presentation. But um, Jessica, would you, um, Tell us about this USC Shoah Foundation Institute for Visual History and Education and what, tell us about Wilsden Reads, tell us about the resources that are available because I we have a lot of educators joining us today. Absolutely. And I, I myself am an educator. I'm a former US history social studies uh, teacher, high school teacher, school administrator. So my heart is with all the educators here today. Um, so yes, I have the privilege of working with USC Shoah Foundation and Mona Golabek in what is called the Wilsden Reads Project, um, which is a culminating performance program, full programmatic piece, educational piece for school districts. But what it really centers on is the Wilsden Project, which is um, a partnership between Mona's Foundation and USC Shoah Foundation. And the USC Shoah Foundation was started in 1995 by Steven Spielberg. Um, he realized that we needed to start, we need to, um, we were gonna lose some of these st stories of the Holocaust, some of these firsthand accounts. And so he wanted a place to collect and house these firsthand testimonials. And so he started the Shoah Foundation. That has since grown because we know that there are other genocides. And so the USC Shoah Foundation 
um, mission is to collect and house those, those firsthand testimonies. And with that, it has grown into this entire educational um, website as well, what we call eyewitness. And it is very forward thinking. It looks at um, using testimony and technology and literacy and history in very unique ways. It is very student centered and student facing. And so um, the Wilson Project is a partnership between USC Shoah Foundation and Mona's Foundation. And it is this um, a wonderful uh, opportunity to create curricular resources that that work with Mona's books that have been um, adapted in the K through 12 classrooms, and we have um, activities that will that center the K two classroom, the three five classroom, and six twelve. Yeah. So there are materials um, that relate to the four different versions of the mm -hmm. book that teachers can access. Teachers can access, it's um, all available at no cost to them. And students can actually access them as well. It's one of the Shoah Foundation's missions is to make activities that students can engage with. We know that technology is what you know, students really enjoy. And so it is, um, there are uh, virtual eye walks that students can go on where you can actually walk the same streets that Mona's mother did. So it's this way of like blending history and literacy and technology while also listening to Mona play music. So it's a, it's a way to, to go back to your, that question, how do you get that music in there? There's ways to do it where it's like just interdisciplinary. It's infused within the teaching of the story. Oh, thank you. So yeah. um, what impact do you, do, you, do you hope or have you seen that these materials have on um, classroom instruction and learning mm -hmm. and teaching? Sure. So I have the privilege of coordinating what is the Wilson Reads program, which brings these resources into classrooms across the, the country and we're in the globe as well. And so I find that um, the, the, the themes that Mona was speaking to of hope and courage and resilience, that's what we hope students walk away with from this story, that it's, it's, it's an entry point you're, you're using the Holocaust and that story as an entry point into these larger themes, right? We're hoping to reach our students, um, giving them a, a, a unique perspective and how to learn about something that is so far in the past, but giving them a sense of hope. And it's, it's, it's not, we, we are trying not to, we don't wanna traumatize our students by teaching them about the Holocaust. We're trying to, so we're, we're offering them a new way, a new perspective um, and, and I find that teachers really resonate with that because I think they're very fearful. Like how am I, how I either I'm not an expert in Holocaust education um, or I, I don't know how to do this safely. So mm -hmm. we provide them with the, a way to do it in a safe way that is pedagogically sound, that is standards aligned and, um, but teaches the story at the same time. All right. So then I'm, I'm assuming that there are different levels that the students themselves could access as well as the mm -hmm. teachers that, of those learners. Yes, the activities are, we have them um, aligned by, you know, grade bands and students can access that themselves and teachers as well. We have teacher guides, we have activities that students can access themselves as well. Wonderful. And then the, and then we, it's all with, it's all designed with those pedagogical frameworks that are appropriate for those different age learners as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Stay, as they say, stay on the line. Um, so let, let's in, um, entertain our audience um, questions. Um, the first one that I, 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 I mentioned um, was, um, whoops, they're scrolling really fast here, so keep them up. Um, how can educators advocate for the arts, whether it's music or even advocating for just libraries um, and reading time, especially with the pressure to catch up after COVID? Hmm. Um, I'm no expert whatsoever. <laughs> I often say the best thing I can do is go out on stage and play the Beethoven. Uh, isn't it like anything in life? Anything. It's like, do we want change? Do we want to see change in our country with the tragedy and not, not to go down that path, but the tragedies that we're seeing? We must advocate. We must have our voices heard. I say this to young people when I'm on the stage. You know what is the right thing to do. You know how to behave and to be kind to someone next to you. We know these things innately and we have to make our voices heard. Thank you. Um, 
Do you have a favorite story about times you had visited classrooms and shared these books with kids? What reactions have you seen from these books, from educators and from children? I always say that the reason I keep going there are two reasons, because of the teachers and because of the students. They give me the strength. First, I need to say to teachers that are here today, you are our heroes, you're my hero. You make a difference in the lives of your young people. You inspire, you can change the course of their life with the choices that you make and the things that you say. So I have the greatest, deepest respect and affection for educators. And then when I look into the eyes and the souls of the young students that I'm in front of, I believe we've passed a couple of million now students that have read the book and or experienced the show in some capacity or whatnot. That's what gives me the strength to keep going because this is not an easy journey. Mm -hmm. And the thousands of letters that we get um, and the artwork that comes to our office, we know that we're doing something that is inspiring a young soul. Um, we were recently in Boston, uh, your hometown, and uh, I had the privilege of, um, we brought this to the diocese, had the privilege of meeting uh, Cardinal Maloney and being in the cathedral and uh, sharing with him. And the teachers there wrote us and said, you've given us a new hero, not someone who has a cape and flies and can shoot out or do special effects, but a young girl who has a dream and has the strength to stand up. And what an incredible statement from that educator when, when she wrote us about that. I remember when we were in Dallas, uh, the head of the superintendent's office said, we will never forget this journey when you came to us and uh, sharing your mother's story. It will probably be one of one, if not the most transformative experience for our students. And it does go back to your question, Pamela, in the beginning, what makes this different mm -hmm. in a certain way? And I, I can say it's the way we converged everything, the music, the storytelling, the multimedia, the book, the way we did to choose this somehow went on a different path and captured the hearts and souls of these young readers. R readers write me and say, I never wanted to read or I don't like reading, but I love your, this book that you wrote. So thank you for, for doing that. So it is such a privilege for us and now my life has changed dramatically because of this partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation that has created these brilliant assets for teachers and students to have. They just recently created a six minute, we have a six minute uh, short uh, animated feature called Music Dreams. And that goes to your other question, Pamela, how do you make it current to today? Mm -hmm. It's an animated feature of Lisa and a young, possibly Latina boy, a refugee, and he's dreaming. And he meets Lisa, a boy from today who gets his inspiration from Lisa and she gets her inspiration from him so that we made it relevant. And recently I just came from El Paso, Texas where we brought it uh, to the community there. And in the audience were these beautiful, beautiful young people. And I'm sure many of them heard from their parents or their grandparents, the stories of coming to America, being near the border and talking to us about it. So. It has enormous relevance to today's um, aching problems that we all are concerned about. Well, thank you. Um, for Rebecca or for Mona, um, the next question asks, do you think educators are feeling pressure not to talk about certain aspects of our history or to be careful about what they say? How do the arts provide a way through this? How do they provide a way to understand our history? Rebecca, I'm going to let you answer that. <laughs> but you um, yeah, yeah, no, that's totally fine. Um, absolutely, they feel that pressure, and I and I work with school districts around the country, and they they do feel the pressure. Um, I'm happy though to also know that there are a lot of advocates out there. So there are a lot of advocates that are are advocating for teachers um, in places where they are feeling that pressure. Um, and you know, I I think that there is something. I, as a, I used to work in New York City schools and they are very data driven. And there is, there are a lot of data out there that proves that teaching through the arts is what really meets our students' needs. And 
teaching and testimony for these firsthand accounts is really what helps to reduce um, anti-Semitism and hatred and the othering of other people. Um, so, you know, I, if I could say anything, lean into your advocates in your community, lean into those parents, raise those voices that really do want to be heard, and then pull out the data. That's where, that's what school districts often listen to. Yes. And even with the pressure on reading and, and literacy and numeracy with our, our, mm -hmm. our learning opportunities, um, lack of learning opportunities through the closings, we're really focusing a lot more on social emotional learning. And we right. know that, you know, the, our, the, the traumas, the, the sadnesses that our students have experienced have to be addressed before we can get them to what one would call the hard skills. I'm not, right. I'm not yeah. happy about those terms, but I'll just- Absolutely. In the, uh, so another question, Mona, you spoke earlier about all the research that you did for the book and consideration of individuals involved. How do you speak to other children's authors about the great responsibility and opportunity involved in writing about history? I have not had the privilege really to uh, interact or meet with other children's authors that much, uh, I must say. Remember, really my background is that I'm a concert pianist and I'm, I'm more on the stage and this foundation work that I'm doing. So I would never, uh, I would never um, put myself to tell another author how to do that. I, I hope I did my path well. <laughs> I constantly ask myself, could I be better? How do I improve? Um, and I think each has to find their path and mm -hmm. their way in life. I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer of live and let live in, in that way. And I just, um, I just hope that I keep improving for myself. That mm -hmm. is what's important for me. This question asked about other authors, but I'm gonna move it to another level and say, do you feel that you, this, the Wilsdon Lane story and the research went into it, um, and Rebecca, with your the, the the materials that are available for students, do you find we are um, fostering researchers and historians? I think the kids get very inspired. I've seen all the projects that have happened. They are very inspired to make videos and poetry and write essays and they, they go into their, what I hope and dream is that Lisa's story will inspire you to find your story, to find your legacy, to find your background, speak about it uh, in the African-American community, in the Hispanic community, because those have been tremendous uh, resonance I have found uh, in the communities that I've traveled through. Um, and yes, I, Rebecca, you could speak to that. I think that the teachers take the, all of this material and then they really dig deeper into the historical aspects of it. This is kind of a pathway. It's, it's, I hope it's an inspiring doorknob that you turn the door and you open it, the Lisa's story and the music and says, come on in, now learn. I don't think, I will say one thing, I don't think there's any luckier author than me. <laughs> Look what happened to me. I just had a dream to tell a story at the piano and every, every step of the way I, I used my music to get me to another person to bang on the door to say, hey, help me to tell this story. Every time I did the theatrical show in a city, I would make sure to bang on the door of a superintendent, make sure I could leave tickets for that superintendent to come. And I, I was able to do that. And then they brought me back to share it with their students. So I think we have something really different here because we not only have the books, but we have the music, the power of that. We have a wonderful story that ends in triumph in the end, which is we want those triumphant stories. And we have all these wonderful assets. So I'm the luckiest author out there. So I would say to other children's authors, go find yourself a USC Shoah Foundation to partner with. <laughs> oh, I would wow. say. Let's move on to another, another question. Your description of the power of music sounds much like many descriptions of the power of religious belief. How would you compare the attributes of the two modalities, music and religion, to provide resilience, courage, and hope through difficult times? The only thing I care about is that no matter what, and I say this to young people, look at your neighbor, look at your friend here, no matter what faith they have, 
uh, and I'm so thrilled that the book is coming out in Arabic now. That's been my dream because in England, when we brought it to 10,000 students in the cathedral, half of them were Muslim students in London. And they all surrounded me after the shows and reading the book and said, when is this book coming out in Arabic so we can share it with our parents? So that was my major, major dream. And in fact, uh, we, are being, we are going to bring this to Washington DC into the National Cathedral uh, next year, where it will be an interfaith council and Iman Majid will come from the Adams Center and Bishop Buddy from the cathedral and Rabbi Lustig from Washington uh, uh, Synagogue. My point being, Yes, the power of faith and respect that person's choice of their faith and break down the walls of hatred that divide us, no matter what faith you are part of, and use your faith to be a better human being in life, to walk a, uh, to walk a better path and to help others. That's what I feel, not to use the faith in any way that separates us. Thank you. Um... Your messages of hope are compelling. What would you say to our audience about sustaining their hope in difficult oh. times? You know, sometimes I think, yes, I even feel some overwhelmed and I know I need to be hopeful. And then I wonder, am I being naive? Am I being Pollyannish? Am I being in unrealistic? So like, where do we find that, 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 that psychological space in which we are being confronting the <clears throat> hatred, the, the, the vitriol that's, that seems to be around and, and how do we help our, our learners either shelter them from it or, or, um, or address it and, and through, through literature, through story, through Lisa, through the Shoah materials. So Rebecca, did you wanna say something or should I, should I go for this? I, I can I can speak for just a moment. Um, you know, I, I do. I say that the way I get through this current time that we're in right now is to keep doing the work, stay in the work every day. Know that I'm at least putting one foot forward. Um, and I think that through storytelling, we break down walls. And so if we can continue to tell these stories, we continue to break down walls. If we continue to have conversations with each other, we continue to break down walls. And I, that's what gives me hope. And also because I do work with young people around the country, they, are, they see a different world ahead of them than what we do. They are, it, it gives me hope. So I say, continue talking to the young people, continue using storytelling. That's continue to have conversations and keep doing the work. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Mona, I'm gonna give you the last word. <laughs> to echo off of what Rebecca said, first, I do need to do a shout out. Uh, I need to say that, yeah, there are many times I, I start the day and think with all that's going on in our world, how the heck can we keep going? We're, it's demoralizing to see so many things happening. And then something marvelous happens, a letter comes through, or I can see into the eyes of a young person, or this is my shout out to one of the most extraordinary people in my life, a mentor to me, who is the, who is the reason that I'm here today. This extraordinary woman named Patty Kenner in New York, who is one of the children that helped to create the Asquith Education Forum, who makes a difference in the lives of so many, as well as myself. Thank you, Patty, for, for uh, introducing me to have this opportunity to this wonderful forum. When we help each other with our dreams, if I can help someone with a dream, if I can make a difference in the life as someone else makes a difference for me and helps me with my dream, uh, that's what keeps me going. And to know that I may have made a difference in a young soul that may have gone another way, wow, I'll keep going till my dying days. And if I can end on just the last chord of the Greek piano concerto as a way of going out, this story ends in triumph when Lisa walks out on that stage and makes her debut. Despite everything that she went through, she ends on this with the tapestry of her life in the audience. <laughs> I
could have ended it better. <laughs> Mona Galabek, thank you so much for sharing your stories, for sharing your writing process, and for sharing your music. And Rebecca Keel, thank you so much for sharing the resources that are available to our educators and to our learners. I want to thank everyone for attending our Ask With Education Forum today. Thank you.